Good afternoon. I want to thank our participants for joining us today. We appreciate your time. And in the interest of everyone's time, we have a hard stop uh, at one hour. And our role, the FMC, is to listen to you. Participants have been forwarded questions, so we will jump right into the questions. Uh, participants have also forwarded us their bios, which we've circulated, and which, we will, uh, which will save us time on introductions. These meetings are being recorded and will be posted on the FMC YouTube page and on the Maritime Transportation Data Initiative webpage. Please, if one of the participants chooses to share something during the presentation discussion, use the share function for the public to be able to review. I wanna also point out that this is a live public meeting. Only participants will be able to speak. We will be posting the meeting on the MTDI webpage for public access. However, we welcome, in fact, we encourage public input. You can email us your feedback on data gaps, data needs at maritime data at fmc.gov. Again, that's maritime data at fmc.gov. Should you choose to submit public feedback, please reference whether it is in reference to an individual meeting or whether it is a general comment. Also, we will be posting submitted your, uh, materials and comments on our webpage. We cannot post PowerPoints, so we ask that material be submitted in Word or PDF format. Please do not include any personal, personal identifiable information, PII, on any submissions to the FMC. We will continue these meetings every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Uh, leading up to our FMC tra Transportation Data Initiative Summit this spring. Uh, we may have to do more than one in a week uh, as we go forward. Uh, last week, we had a good meeting with the uh, intermodal chassis industry. If you haven't seen it, please look at the FMC YouTube channel on our webpage. Today, we are hearing from the representatives of our major uh, US intermodal railroads. I'm really happy that they're here. Uh, they're a critical uh, component of, of, of our industry, our intermodal delivery system. Uh, if we have time, uh, uh, after your uh, observations, uh, I may ask for some uh, uh, follow-up questions. Uh, I did want to uh, point out um, a couple of, uh, of factors. Uh, this has been a, an incredibly challenging uh, situation with uh, our supply chain. Uh, and we've had uh, a situation where we've seen an incredible growth of intermodal uh, transportation trade uh, since COVID-19. Uh, it's been a challenge to say the least, but I, I really think uh, we, we need to recognize the efforts of the industry and in continuing to deliver record loads of, of cargo shipments uh, to the United States. Uh, I don't think we would have foreseen this market explosion and it has been a market explosion in intermodal uh, shipping um, uh, at the beginning of the- Railroads. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, context. I actually wanted to hear this one because I want to hear if- Hey, Carl. Hey, Carl. Yep, you're on. Uh... We, can hear, we can hear you. Okay, so so anyways, uh, 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 but, but there have been challenges and we're here really to look at uh, a data and what role data can play in providing uh, more information, uh, the ability uh, to move through the supply chain uh, with more ease and efficiency. Uh, I wanted to point out uh, some of the statistics from our ports are, are flowing in from last year's um, uh, 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 cargo tallies. And uh, last year, the port of LA uh, increased uh, by 13% over any previous record year. The port of Long Beach was 15.7% higher than any record year. The port of Virginia uh, recorded 25% more cargo movements in containers than ever before. South Carolina State Ports Authority uh, was at 12.9% increase. Uh, Port of Savannah uh, is a 20% growth uh, in 2021. And the Port of Houston, a 15% growth. So we have seen incredible movements of expanded uh, uh, containerized cargo and, uh, and it's challenged our port uh, infrastructure. Uh, I really believe that the railroads have a huge role to play and our continued ability to transport intermodal cargo. Uh, it's, it's simply the easiest way to get large volumes through very congested uh, port environments into the interior uh, areas of our country where we can handle it more efficiently. Um, I was out in Utah recently and they're looking at an inland port from uh, the port of Long Beach. But if we can get cargo on intermodal rail, uh, 
uh, uh, trains and get it to places where it can be handled more efficiently, it's going to go a long way in helping alleviate uh, the uh, uh, the movement system at our at our ports, which just don't really have the room to to handle uh, cargo moving forward. Um, unfortunately, the railroads had a tough time uh, of it. Uh, they did have an increase of 6.6% according to the American Association of Railroads, which was their highest levels of intermodal uh, transport ever. Um, but uh, the fact that there's such a big gap between the increase, uh, increase that the railroads had and the uh, amount of cargo uh, going into US ports means that they are utilizing truck transportation for intermodal moves to a greater extent. Uh, in terms of, of adjusting to these trade uh, imbalances. And, and frankly, we need uh, the railroads to be uh, stronger uh, going forward. Uh, and, and I do think uh, I'm hearing uh, reports of, of increased investment. And uh, uh, I will say uh, I'm a skeptic of precision railroading. Uh, it seems to me that if you wanna grow and the market is providing you cargo, you invest and you uh, provide uh, business opportunities as well as as, as opposed to uh, cutting back on service and employment. Uh, so I, I really think that uh, this is an area data uh, where we can do better uh, to help uh, the industry move more efficiently uh, to uh, uh, to facilitate uh, intermodalism uh, and I, and I do want to see it. So I'm interested to hear from uh, from each of the four participants today about where they see gaps in information uh, that they're not getting from the intermodal uh, ocean carriers, the terminals, uh, from trucking, uh, from other elements that uh, are part of the supply chain. Uh, what sort of information they uh, uh, can provide uh, to make things uh, fl uh, flow more uh, more uh, effectively. Um, and uh, and so so with that, I'm going to turn it over. We have uh, I, in my in my view for the uh, best railroads in the world uh, talking today. Uh, Jim Bishop, director of international sales from the Union Pacific uh, Railroad. Scott uh, Hernandez, uh, assistant vice president of Intermodal Business Unit uh, Operation System (BNSF). Uh, and actually, if we don't have your new title, we apologize. Uh, but we we had heard that there was. Uh, a change in title and, and the affirmative. So uh, DeAndre Larry, Group Vice President, International Marketing and Sales, Norfolk uh, Southern Corporation, and and, Dr and Jay Strongowski, uh, Director of Intermodal uh, Sales for CSX Transportation. I really appreciate all of you uh, being available and uh, telling us some of the challenges uh, that you're facing uh, in this area and, uh, and illuminating a uh, uh, us about uh, uh, what's going on with, with your companies. Uh, I think I'll turn to uh, Jim first. Uh, Jim, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, present your information. Thank you, Commissioner, and appreciate the warm invite and opportunity to respond back to the questions relative to this data initiative. So if I may, I think really when we look at it, the starting point of the key data elements is about what's on those vessels and when it's going to, I think, not only just uh, arrive, but it's about per vessel of really how many containers are on there for Union Pacific, what marine terminal it's going into, as well as what destination markets those are going into. So certainly the vessel arrival is uh, one piece of that. As far as how we get that information, we receive that in a number of different ways via API, EDI, even through some emails and some forecasts. I would say of all those that uh, EDI 404, which we receive from the ocean carriers, is the highest level of detail and guidance really that we get. Generally speaking, we receive those about seven to 10 days in advance of when a container comes online for us. The next level of data that we see is really at the marine terminal level. So those events we're talking about there is the vessel discharged, loaded to a rail car, so those 322 messages. And then really when it's released to the railroad, the 418 message, which ultimately is at that point in time is please come get this and, and pull that from that our yard. For understanding, and I think most on this call uh, do, but for those maybe are not aware, the majority of the volume via the US West Coast 
that Union Pacific does is loaded on dock. And basically what that is, is that's where Union Pacific spots and pulls the marine terminals directly, therefore eliminating any truck movements in and out of those marine terminals. So as you said, uh, commissioners, it's highly efficient, ability to move a lot amount of volume in a very densified way. And as I said, so the majority of that, the movements that we do to and from the US West Coast are on dock shipments. As it relates to exports, if I may, just to generalize it, is it's very similar data flow as I've walked through, it's just a different direction. That being said, there is some new data elements that are introduced. Number one, the booking numbers relative to that export as well as the vessel information. So as those two ties together, it's really trying to target getting the right boxes at the right time moving westbound. Also, I'd like to- Just uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, could you uh, elaborate when you get the booking uh, numbers and who you get it from uh, and, and the other data on export? Uh, uh, let's say you're in Chicago and you're gonna go to uh, LA, who provides the information and, and when does it get there in general? I know it changes. We get that information from the ocean carriers when they supply us that rail bill, way billing, once again, which is in advance of any container coming in through our gate at an inland ramp at a place as Chicago. So they supply us the booking number as well as what vessel. Also, I'd like to add Union Pacific on the export side also repositions empty containers on behalf of the ocean carriers to other regions of the US that are deficit empty containers. In those cases, it's where we provide a high level of visibility of what containers are coming in at the inland ramp, as well as to meet what the demand is at that destination for them to load for exports. So we have a number of those that we've put together it really helped facilitate in getting those containers to deficit areas where we can promote more exports out of the US and containers. And at the same time, promote the round trip economics for the ocean care. So just another piece in how that fits in there. Additionally, Union Pacific provides data to our customers, uh, Commissioner, really in a number of a variety of ways. So the most pressing and what we've really seen kind of a, a big increase is, is in the API interchange of data. Likewise, the EDI flows of data on a, on a number of events and reporting that we've been doing. Likewise, via our website, so customers can come there as well. And then I'd also include that we have automated emails and reports going out to customers at the same time. So a whole different number of pathways that we're sharing information with our customers. That being said, that concludes my comments to the questions. That was great, uh, Jim. Uh, I did wanna, uh, I'll, I'll go to our next uh, uh, participants uh, shortly, but is there too many sources of data? I mean, uh, if you have EDI coming in and, and different feeds from different people, um, uh, is there too much? Uh, uh, and are there are there uh, are there differences in the and the and the information depending on who you're getting the information from, in general? You know, that's a good question, and I think a, a keen observation. And I don't necessarily would say that there's too many and too much. I would think and, and agree with I think some of of the feedback you've received in prior session. Is there a better way that we can collectively work to promote visibility on that? Certainly, I think there's some avenues for that. With, with regard to, you know, we've been doing this for a number of decades. So it isn't necessarily that there's gaps, but is there some opportunity to pro, you know, provide a little bit better visibility? I, th I think that's the way I'd answer that. And that being said, is you know some of the different technology automation more streamlining that I think allows us to do that. Oh, that was great, uh, great uh, observations, uh, Scott uh, Hernandez. Uh, why don't you go next? I appreciate it, and first and foremost, really just appreciate the opportunity here to discuss this and the important you know these freight chain matters are supply chain matters are extremely important here and. 
as you know, BNSF has participated in several of these forums and really what we want to do is make sure that we're working hard to handle the uh, volume that exists out there. Like you said, there were some challenges, but we really want to be here to support our customers, support the supply chain as necessary. Um, so kind of to go into some of the questions that you guys outlined, and first and foremost, how do we get the data? I think it's very similar to what, what Jim noted. We use a lot of the same type of things with EDI, really moving towards the API functionality. Um, with that said, we do other things where we do website polls. We have um, different services we use, such as, you know, Marine Exchange to get vessel information. And then just like everyone else, we go into simple things like emails to, to communicate back and forth about the volume out there. So we use a lot of different uh, ways to communicate the volume. And really, we're trying to capture the same type of information. You know, I'll talk a little bit about the differences between east and westbound freight or import versus export traffic. But, you know, some of the key things we're looking at in both ways is really how much When's it coming and where's it going? I mean, those are some of the very basic things that we really try to figure out. Um, if you get into specifics, uh, you know, we're looking for unit counts, destinations. Um, arrival times are extremely important for us. That's both from a, um, we're talking about an import side. It's really about vessel arrival times, upload times. Um, those things are really important to help us um, plan. And, and one thing I would add to that information, it's not just, you know, what we get, it's when we get, it's extremely important. So for example, right now we get the information um, from our customers that gives us about three to five days worth of heads up on things that are coming in port to, into the United States, into the Southern California. Um, really what would be helpful is we can get that information further back into the supply chain. When it leaves or to call, you know, get that 10 to 12 day notice. What that really would allow us to do is to gain some additional efficiencies to get resources in place to handle the, the demand that's out there. When we're at three to five days, that, that could be challenging when we have to move stuff from Chicago resources, that's locomotives, rail cars, people, to get them in position to handle that volume. Any additional notice is uh, extremely valuable for us to be able to, to, to meet the demand that's out there. So that's one thing that we look at. It's, it's not just uh, uh, what we get, it's when we get that information is uh, extremely important to us. So uh, another thing to add on, the, if we look on the export side, you know, it's really important to make that connection with the, the port terminals um, and understanding what their capabilities and, and conditions are and how do we connect that with what we're sending that direction. Um, right now, we have visibility uh, usually with when the units build and when it shows up on our property. Um, we don't have too much advanced notice at this point of, of how much is coming in a, in a future state. Again, we might know today. We don't know three to four days out how much is coming for what specific location. Um, and then again, that connection point with the terminal operators to understand what their capabilities and conditions are, what vessels they're loading for. We've piloted programs where we're partnering with our steamship line partners um, on getting additional information about what vessels those units are booked for. How can we better sequence the freight based on what the actual vessel need is? Um, those are types of information that can be, again, very valuable and helpful to making sure that we're looking at it from a more holistic perspective. Right? versus just what BNSF needs. What does it need from the port? Again, because the intent here is to speed the entire supply chain. If we can do that, that helps everybody, right? That helps us, it helps the customers, it helps the, the terminal operators that we have on, on the West Coast as well. So that's one thing um, that, we are, that we could really continue to partner with is getting that full end-to-end -end visibility a little further in advance. Um, some other items here um, that we look at, I would say is, um, you know, when we look at what additional information um, that's out there or what we provide back, again, I would say that EDI and, and data interface is the most important things that we're really looking forward to. Um, but again, right now, we, we partner well with our customers. Uh, we continue to try to expand those horizons. And hopefully, as we talk here, I mean, a lot of the challenges Jim brought up are, are very similar to what we see um, at BNSF, and, and there's not too much a disconnect there. Um, but in the end, uh, we're, we're, we're ready. We've got capacity here to move more IPI international container volume here to the West Coast ports and, and definitely ready to partner. Uh, very good observations. Uh, I appreciate it. And I know it's sort of difficult because we have four uh, railroads that are probably going to say the uh, some of the same thing. Don't worry about that. Uh, it helps us just to get a sense of, of what each one, uh, each participant uh, feels is important for that for their a company, and so uh, don't don't uh, have any uh, reservations about uh, explaining what's important, even if it is uh, uh, slightly redundant. Um, let's see who, who we have. Uh, we have uh, 
Uh, DeAndre, Larry, uh, why don't you go next? Thank you, Commissioner Bensel, for the opportunity to take part in this discussion. As you said, my name is DeAndre Larry. I'm the Group Vice President for International and Modal for Norfolk Southern. I appreciate your comments from earlier and, and your support, and we wholeheartedly agree. As you have discussed in previous sessions, the supply chain is the complex array of market participants that are each interconnected to move goods across the globe. In order for that to occur, we must all communicate effectively. We believe that an important component of effective communication is sharing forecasts with one another. We work with our steamship customers and port partners to best understand the volume that wants to move onto our network. We desire accurate forecasts and visibility to make sure that we have resources in the right places to provide high quality service. Forecasts are critical to both the export and import side. For example, import forecasts allow us to plan for equipment that is needed for the anticipated export volume in our terminals. We are a network and having accurate and timely forecasts allow us to plan and operate a balanced network that runs more efficiently and provides a higher degree of service. Forecasts are shared with us by our port partners and by our steamship customers. At NS, we are on a technology journey with our customers. We share API updates on freight as it flows across our network so our customers can better manage their traffic flows and organize their business activities. And we do all of this by staying close to our customers and listening to them. We survey our customers about our, our current data interaction to make sure we are aligned on our, on our journey. I can report that our recent survey said that we're sharing data, data in a way that's in line with their processes as well. In closing, we compliment the commission for taking on this complex and important topic with rigor and balance. Thank you for allowing Norfolk Southern to, the opportunity to participate. Thanks, DeAndre. Um, and finally, uh, Jay uh, uh, Strongowski, uh, you're gonna back clean up and, uh, uh, and then I'll have some questions for all of you. Okay, <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to talk today. Um, I, you know, we see, you know, you know, data harmonization is uh, you know critical, right? So we're, we're in a supply chain, and, and predictability is what we're all striving for. Um, I guess you know to, to to on comments that have already been shared. You know, the, the the rail industry has an EDI standard protocol, so a lot of us are sharing and, and receiving the same information and utilizing it. I can assume in in very similar ways. You know, what we're doing with the customers, you know, from the billing standpoint, is we are trying to identify differences in freight flows. Um, will that be most importantly on the import side, because you, you want to be able to predict if there's changes in demands of your services, where you've got to connect with a, a marine terminal partner. <clears throat> As in terms of what we send to our customers, we return EDI messaging with ship and tracing information, notifications of a box availability, you know, instructions for pickups. Um, yeah, you know, this is all done between us and the steamship lines primarily because that's who our customer base is. Uh, but this, uh, you know, the standardization is what I think we've all described has served the industry very well. You know, there's, in at least CSX's experience, there's very few errors and it allows us to seamlessly interchange traffic between, you know, uh, railroads, both east and west. You know, commentary around, you know, what data is missing, you know, we receive pretty good information from, from all of our, the stakeholders, whether it be our steamship lines uh, and, and our port partners. We receive it, you know, in, in, in some cases we're receiving it electronically, other cases it's, it's a matter of emails and, and conference calls and other things. Um, but generally it, it tends to work out very well, but I will tell you, we're always looking for better ways to, to create more visibility. Um, you know, I would say that, you know, the biggest thing for us in our efforts is about understanding the change in demand. It's not necessarily what demand's going to be tomorrow. It's what demand's going to be tomorrow if it's different than today or different from, from last Wednesday, for example. So, you know, for us, that's really where, where we're, we're trying to understand and, and identify is how can we get ahead of changes in traffic patterns. So, you know, that's the, that's the journey that we're on here. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm certain that you know, my colleagues from the other railroads would, would probably agree with some of those uh, those comments. Uh, it's interesting. I've heard all of you talk about forecasting. So it, it appears that, that that's one of the major challenges, uh, just trying to get on top of it. I think, Scott, you made uh, the point that basically if you don't 
get it in within 10 to 12 days it really doesn't allow you to adjust much. You basically have to be reactive, uh, but, uh, but greater cooperation on, uh, on surge uh, 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 needs and, and, and probably the reverse. Um, I did want to ask, um, you know, there was a lot of information early on in the, in the, uh, in the supply chain disruption uh, that revealed uh, that we did we didn't have enough uh, intermodal chassis, um, and uh, and uh, and I know that uh, you have uh, uh, domestic chassis that you purchase for your domestic customers, and you you uh, the steamship lines work to provide uh, yeah, in, information on intermodal chassis, and and the information was that early on when the surge occurred, we had uh, uh, limitations on on railroad intermodal cars being in the right place, the right right time and also on, on chassis. What sort of information, and I'll pose this to all of you, do you have about the availability of equipment uh, to do that trucking? And uh, I was talking about uh, the importance I uh, subscribe to having in effective uh, railroad uh, intermodal service. And that's not a slight uh, to truckers because in fact, truckers will always carry a load from a railroad terminal or for a port terminal. It's just, where's the most effective place to, to carry it? Uh, from, but what sort of information do you have about the availability of equipment? Uh, is is this sort of ad hoc, uh, and how to how how tell tell me more in this area? And uh, why don't you start off, Jim? Sure, I think it's um, relative to the the chassis piece specifically. This, I think, what we all collectively observed in twenty twenty one was an interesting phenomena is the street turn times of those chassis in many cases was twice what it normally is. So let's just hypothetically say instead of a chassis being out on the street four or five days, all of a sudden it's nine, 10 days, is all of a sudden that just consumed an inordinate additional amount of chassis. As you coupled on, well, we're already starting to see a big uptick in volume. So it consumes so much of that asset. The, the pieces that we saw and see is we know what containers want to try and come back to us. We know that those chassis will be coming back into that yard, but it was really difficult. I think the timing of how many will come in that day, because in the meantime, I'm landing trains left and right. And so the timing to ensure um, the right chassis at the right place on the right day, I think was a little challenging to overcome relative to just the big spike in the elongated street turn times. Um, uh, Scott, I, I think one of the other challenges we had is, is this cargo built up in the intermodal rail yards. You went from, you know, wheeled operations uh, to having to lay down the cargo and that requires additional handling uh, equipment and gear. So what is your experience in terms of the wheels that you need to move things uh, to and from uh, and 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 basically, it seems the only time you get any uh, access to information about them is when they come in the gate. Yeah, I mean, I think Jim hit it well. I mean, uh, the intermodal business, is like any supply chain, is very cyclical, right? And and so we have great visibility and communication on on what is available on property, right? We know what the demand is and what we need to get. You know, the challenge is, do we know what's going to come in the gate um, on a certain day to give that supply? That's really where the challenge starts to come in of, of what, what are we going to load that day to create it? And it's and, and it's just a reminder, I mean, in the, in the intermodal world, we have, you know, chassis that are very specific to certain customers, right? So it's not just um, how many containers are going to come in, it's what specific customer or, or chassis pool provider is going to come in and that's where things get difficult like Jim said when you have a certain train with a certain mix of chassis needs on one train that's not what came in the gate at the same rate that day that's where we have the challenge a little bit and and I think Jim hit on it you know it's it's hard as we talk to these our chassis uh, partners there you know they're they're challenged as well to understand you know based on some of the things that they were seeing right in the middle of the pandemic with when will these boxes actually be brought back you know with what was going on we we're seeing at the warehouse side as well some of their challenges with, with um, you know, folks being impacted by COVID. So, I mean, that's probably the biggest challenge that we saw is being able to get that information further out versus, you know, just right when it shows up. I think I'll switch the questions uh, to, to, uh, to Jay and DeAndre. Um, uh, 
what sort of visibility can you provide on your yard operation? So for instance, if I want to, uh, to get uh, uh, access to cargo in your yard uh, and you don't have equipment that day uh, to do it, what sort of information can you and do you provide about uh, operational uh, issues that are F F impacting uh, your yard and, and how do you do that? Uh, uh, DeAndre, you want to uh, lead? Yeah, I had an answer for your other question too, so I'd like to have a chance for that too. But, <laughs> that was, uh, a, that was a bait and switch, probably wasn't yeah. nice. So uh. so two things, we uh, we have our Access NS, that's what our shippers use, that's our customer portal for them to see what's, what's at our terminals, what's available to them, and they can come pick that up. Uh, more episodically, we have service alerts and things like that if something out of the ordinary were to occur like winter weather that we're seeing right now. So those are the two ways that I would say we communicate that. Okay. If I may, just to go back to your question about the chassis, uh, you know, we had several workshops with truckers in all of our major markets to listen for one, you know, do you see things improving? How do you see things working? But also listening for other things that we can do. And one, one bit of data we uncovered is that 85% of the time, a trucker that brings something into our terminal leaves empty. And so we said, if we could make that even 50% in Chicago, that'd be like increasing the truckers in the market by a thousand truckers a week. And so we introduced what we call our dual mission program, where we pay truckers $200 if they can achieve 50% dual missions. And we pay it on all the missions that they come into our terminal with that lead up to that 50%. And we think that helps the owner operators wanna to come to our terminals more. We think that helps our shippers attain more truckers because we want you know, them to be attracted to doing that type of work. So we think there, is an, there was a slight inefficiency in the market that we said we think we can close by introducing an incentive to truckers who aren't typically our customers, but by getting close to them, we found something out that we were able to, to implement. And we've seen some success. Yeah, no, I know I, I met with your government folks and we've talked about purchases that they're doing to, 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 uh, to reinvest in, in the domestic chassis market. And th that dual move situation is most productive, but doesn't always work depending on if you're just taking one load in, uh, you're, you know, that's your cargo, but it's, it's, it's the most efficient way. So I'm, I'm glad they're, uh, you're doing that. So uh, um, uh, uh, Jay, uh, any thoughts on this or uh, uh, on this issue, just in terms of uh, managing your internally uh, information about your, your terminal and, and, and what's there and what's, what's not. Sure. So you know, we operate, you know, on, on the inland side, we operate two different models at the terminal level. Um, many of our larger facilities are grounded operations. So by design, we are putting boxes onto the ground. Um, and, you know, the intent of that is to be able to hold more boxes longer. And frankly, you know, by doing that, you're also not at risk of mounting a box on a, on wheels, which has no intentions of leaving in the near term or even going out the gate and maybe sitting for a longer period of time. So, you know, in those cases, you know, Chassis shortages, while they may be real in the marketplace, it's not as impactful to our operations. Where we've seen chassis shortages, where we've got an, we're operating a wheeled model, that's when we we deal with more challenges and the inefficiencies of putting a box on the ground, um, because by operational design you intended to put it up on a chassis, and it's in those cases where you run into congestion and and then. That, that, that chassis then becomes that much more valuable because like I described in the other model, you know, you're suddenly perhaps putting a box onto a set of wheels. It's very valuable in the marketplace that may sit for a number of days for one reason or another. And, you know, in that way, that chassis effectively becomes, you know, a lost piece of equipment for the, the broader operation. Uh, you know, we work with the chassis providers on the international side and the domestic side for that matter, really to try to identify, you know, the similar things we talked about in the in, in my opening comments around predicting change in, in freight flows. We try to do the same thing by, you know, giving them information that helps probably helps supplement the information that they're receiving from their customers who in these cases are the steamship lines. So, you know, where there's a lot that goes on, it's, you know, there's a lot of communication, um, but, you know, as one of, I think Jim mentioned, uh, you know, the the experience in terms of 
chassis and time on the street had grown exponentially during the worst of times. And I'm sure the chassis providers had has relayed, you know, some of their experience as well. Well, you know, I mean, they get paid pretty in no matter what. So it's, it's, it's uh, the question is usually the, the transport providers that are snarled in this. Uh, so we, we, we probably need to think of how we're going to manage this resource uh, better for uh, those that are engaged in, in transportation. Uh, so um, on the rail side itself, in terms of if I would just wanted to know where my cargo is, we uh, met with American Association of Railroads and they said, uh, the companies jointly use Raillink uh, to sort of track where where cargo is. Is that the, the common? And I'll, I guess I'll turn to uh, Jay. Just uh, uh, what's the system that you, as an industry, use to uh, monitor where your your uh, your trains are, train sets? Yeah, we're relaying information. Uh, we're relaying information. Raillink receives some information, but a lot of the tracking and tracing is from us, though. Okay. And so. You know, we're pushing that information to our customers via EDI, um, and you know they are also through our web-based um, and, and and handheld-based applications able to track specific boxes. You know, it can become inefficient if you're tracking large sums of them. But right, you know, so our customers have the ability to track and trace it and receive all their information, you know, via via EDI as well as through you know self. Okay, and I, I assume that's the same with with all they do. You guys do your own tracking, and you know when it gets past mile post and then slow down and in certain areas, and and that's to customers. Do you provide that information to the steamship lines at all, or or as well? Yeah. Okay. Um, so in terms of uh, of the congestion that we're having at the ports, so there's just not a lot of room, and so as I mentioned earlier. Um, if we don't take advantage of, of railroad intermodal uh, on dock rail, uh, in my view, we will not be able to be successful in handling all of the congestion. Uh, it's a critical component going forward. And there's a lot of efforts going on. Uh, I mentioned Long Beach is, is looking at the inland port of Utah, uh, uh, Pacific Northwest uh, uh, ports are looking at uh, a couple of sites as well. Um, uh, and Oakland uh, uh, in the East Coast, uh, uh, Georgia Ports Authority has a number of inland port uh, sites. I know they've probably been working with Norfolk Southern and CSX and and, uh, um, uh, and uh, in New York, they have some uh, programs, Baltimore's looking at it. So it's, it's, it's starting to evolve as a network of both coastal ports and inland ports fed by the railroads intermodal services. What can we do to really um, to stimulate that to, to make sure it's uh, uh, I think I, I forget who it was mentioned it was so much more efficient uh, to, to do on dock rail and, and, and directly get out uh, cargo. But is there anything that we can do um, uh, to facilitate more uh, utilization of of uh, of on dock rail and inland uh, 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 port terminals? I know this is a little bit. Uh, a policy question, but but if there's also data elements. What can we, what can we do in this area to make sure there is an expedited type of movement of cargo uh, that is um, railroad cargo? I know you're open 24 hours seven. Is it like doing cargo at night for the railroads uh, and moving it out? Uh, I don't know. So uh, Jim, why don't you uh, take a crack at that? So the questions relative to the expediting traffic. Yeah, through using intermodal rail, what what can we do with data to to to, to facilitate that and 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 and, and policies? You know, uh, open it up a little bit. I think I think you hit on one of the key things and and what we've observed and seen, especially in a time where you're trying to move as much freight as you can as quickly as you can into the interior of the U.S. and back, and really turning those assets as quick as you can. We're 24 seven operation. It varies the different port terminals on how many shifts and hours they work. So I think, you know, commissioner ideally is if everyone were working 24 seven, that's one way you could do it. Is that realistic? I think it has some different challenges. I do, I do think one thing of the real benefit and what I think we've seen a pivot away from in the last year by a number of different supply chain partners 
Yeah, sure. Union Pacific and my other railroad friends here, we're 24 seven. I think the thing people had to little pivot away from in this current environment and moving forward is to think you can be Monday through Friday, eight to five and still try and promote a lot of growth and you know, international commerce is gonna be a little bit challenging. But since the railroads are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it would seem that if you were going to do night operations, the most logical source of cargo flow would be through the railroads. I think that's fair comment. Um, uh, did any anyone else want to uh, comment on, on on how to what's how can we do do better in encouraging um, uh, movement of expedited cargo through our, our terminals? Is there, uh, is it, uh, again, I, I go back to Utah, they have a plan on data transfer to allow a quick, easy move. Um, and uh, I look at uh, our domestic uh, uh, transportation companies, uh, Matson in Hawaii, uh, they have a service that, it, you know, you, 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 it goes from one place to, to another. Uh, a lot of our other cargo goes from a terminal, sits there for a while, if you can find trucking, to a place where it's going to be devanned uh, into a 53 foot container and can get trucking to the railroad from there. Uh, you can move, but there's implicitly there's, it's not an expedited service. Any thoughts uh, from either Jay uh, Scott or uh, uh, DeAndre on, on, on what we could do to, 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 to uh, move this cargo on an expedited basis? Uh, yeah. I'll start off with, uh, with Scott, we'll keep it in order. Yeah, I've got a, a few comments there. and. You know, that's something that we've looked and tried to partner with our, our steamship line partners on ability to have inland areas for them to either just evacuate freight freight via truck or via train, right? And, and I think what we see right now is, is we have assets and capacity available to move the traffic if, if it can get loaded onto a rail car. And, and we, we know that some of our marine terminal partners, you know, have had to use on-dock rail capacity just to stack boxes to be able to handle all the volumes out there. So how do we create the environment and conditions where we can get back to utilizing the volume and the capacity that exists? Because right now the capacity is there. We have assets idle across our network waiting to be utilized if we can get the volume up on a rail car and go. So so in, in my mind, when I hear you talk about uh, what we could do, it's how do we create an environment where we can get that onto the rail, take advantage of the capacity we have both at the west end and east end of our railroad, as well as resources be able to utilize that. Uh, DeAndre? Yeah, the only thing I'd add is, you know, the, the inland piece is important. So I think you touched on it earlier astutely that if we, if the ports are 24 by seven, if we're 24 by seven and it lands in Chicago, Kansas City, or, you know, Columbus, Ohio, and the warehouses are closed on the weekend, we, you can understand how the accordion starts to happen. And so it's key for the entire supply chain to be in sync with, with this because, you know, the, yeah. there's, you know, the free market, we, we want to solve for less than 50% of the traffic that comes import on the West Coast goes IPI. Less than a quarter that comes into the East Coast goes IPI. That's a huge opportunity for all of us on this call that we want to solve for, but we all have to be in sync. We being the entire supply chain, the ports, the railroads, the warehouses, the drainage community, the chassis owners, and and that's the task. Yeah, I think I think the, the East Coast ports are working on that. Uh, Howard Street Tunnel and uh, other uh, projects are, are are going on. And I think everybody in the port world. Uh, I think uh, um, the port of Wilmington, North Carolina, State Ports Authority is looking at the at a rail terminal in uh, in, in North Carolina. And I think uh, long term, if we don't take advantage of this, we're probably going to miss out uh, because of the, the volumes are just stunning. Uh, uh, Jay, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the last, the only thing I would add is that, you know, the marine terminals are in this with us, right? So these marine terminals, particularly up and down the East Coast, you know, have invested heavily. And, you know, anytime we see, you know, connecting stakeholders investing in infrastructure, you know, we want to be there to serve them. And you know, so getting cargo off the the ports while there are always exceptions and always issues that you're always challenged with i think by and large is is being addressed in terms of rail um not as close to to what might be experienced locally at the the local discharge and truck truck gates but at least in terms of rail you know there's there's plenty of investment that's gone on to connect to the inland points and create that inland port experience 
um, that, that you described. So uh, I wanted to get back to the point on forecasting for, uh, you know, uh, uh, that may have been the biggest challenge. I think, Jim, you, you, uh, you in, and everyone sort of touched on it. Uh, uh, so you get forecasts right now from the steamship lines that give you basically some information sort of on an ad hoc basis about what their volumes might be. But how granular is that and how helpful is it, uh, for instance, uh, uh, with, the, with the pandemic? Uh, and do you get any information from shippers themselves? Uh, Jim, you want to start? Sure. Yeah, we, we get, I mean, it's, it's evolved over time, commissioners is before we were maybe as technological as we are today is a lot of that and maybe one could even say before email that that information was being exchanged pretty readily and then really you fast forward where we're at today is we get a general kind of forecast from the ocean carriers directly so those are our customers as that freight is on vessel and moving our way then we've recently plugged in in, in, on the, uh, in Los Angeles, Long Beach to where we're getting some real live API data feeds is that it's arrived, it's been discharged in those events as they're actually happening and moving through the marine terminal. As, as some of the others is it's really about that pivot just before that so we're able to have the right resources at the right time. The critical component being uh, the well cars, obviously, but at the same time, locomotives and train crews. So just that 24 hour, 36 hour window where it's data driven instead of kind of where we've been is a, a conference call or an email from somebody, you know, that really has helped drive efficiency and productivity. So if you, if you get it, as I think uh, Scott said, 10 day out, that would, that would give you time to reposition assets to take reactive, uh, uh, action as a, as opposed to uh, to uh, proactive action as as opposed to reactive action. You know, it's an interesting balancing act, and the what we're trying to do and what we've talked on as well is is manage the expectation of these exporters. So we're continually flowing freight coming back west, and at the same time, it's knowing and injecting you know the right place, the right time where we maybe need to supplement with some other equipment into this marine terminal on that day. And when you look in the uh, San Pedro port complex, which is the biggest for us on the US West Coast, is you know you have upwards of 14 marine terminals, nine of which were actively doing a significant amount of on-dock volume, is it isn't even so much commissioner that I have equipment in the complex, is I've got to have it at one of those right terminals on that shift that they want to load. Or, or you start to fall behind and lose productivity and efficiency, that's very, very difficult to get back. Right, right. So I wanted to get on train sets. When you're making up intermodal train sets, and I visited with the ocean carrier, and, and they said, uh, they, it sort of, I, I was surprised. I, I thought you functioned a little bit more like common carriers, that anybody could come in at any point and, and drop off intermodal cargo, but you deal with larger shippers and or larger uh, ocean carriers and domestic uh, uh, trucking companies and it's not a, a pure open system um, how do you what sort of information do you provide about when there's availability on your terminals uh, for uh, space on a train set going to wherever it's going to go and so I'm going to start uh, in order and and ask Jim uh, to start off with and then go from there yeah, what Union Pacific has is we have a web-based system on UP, myupr.com. It's a, called our Intermodal Terminal Reservation System, where our shippers can go in there in a given lane on a given day, and they can allocate reservations to ensure they have a spot to come in that gate on that day. So that matches up exactly what that train capacity is available. As we see that start to bump up, that's when we know we need to supplement in with some additional train start or service to be able to move the freight. At the same time, you know, we see everything that moved in eastbound. So it just coincides. We know we need to move it back out west, but we have that tool that we've developed in the last years to help really provide predictability and visibility to customers of coming back in the gate. 
So how 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 far in advance is that uh, that they can get on the website and 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 reserve space on a on a on a, on a train set? Uh, I might be mistaken, but I believe we're out there eight business day eight, eight okay. business days, which is every day for us, uh, and then they have the ability to go in and manage and change those on a, on a given basis as well. Oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, uh, Scott. Yeah. So on BNSF, we, we predominantly have an open gate system. So where we don't have any regular, uh, restrictions on when somebody can bring something in. Um, we, we take, we we have a very strong bias for, for growing and handling as much of the volume we efficiently handle. And so that's why we have that policy in place. You know, with that said, you know, there are times where if we have a facility that gets into a certain con elevated condition where it becomes unproductive, then we might have to put um, things in place to, to manage the flow of volume in there with the, with the main purpose of being, we know if we keep ourselves at the optimal operating condition, we can handle more volume overall for the supply chain than if we restricted ourselves. So that's a, that's an exception based system that we manage, um, ad hoc and those are usually direct conversations with a customer if we have to do that but you know we 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 continue to have an open gate policy at the at the all our facilities there where we allow the volume to come in and, and we manage through that through added resources on our side to be able to handle the volumes necessary Could you explain the open gate system a little bit more does that mean that a truck just shows up with cargo or is there a notification that there's space to to shippers that uh, goes out no most of our facilities completely open they can show up at any time with any amount of okay. volume um, at most of our facilities. Have you seen the gates get clogged up, clogged up just because so many people want space on, on your, your train set? And you provide notice that your, this set is going to be leaving at this point, and, the, and, the, and then everybody knows that, and then they sh uh, show up first come, first serve. Uh, is that how it operates? Cor correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, the congestion that we build our facilities, knowing what our peak flows look like to be able to, the gates to be able to handle those. Okay. You know, the only time we might run into a, a, an issue is if that continues to build over a long period of time where it's access to what the production capabilities of the facility are. But th that is an exception base and not, not the normal practice. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, DeAndre. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. I'll touch on both the inland side and then the port side. For the inland side, it's it's mostly like what Scott just described that they do. Uh, our gates are always open. Uh, it's an exception-based system when we, you know, have volume that um, needs to hold out to to sort of accommodate what we have going on, on the ramp. On the port side, we talk daily, uh, share information and forecast daily and weekly with our port partners because we're on dock there, and so they're they're showing us and the steamship lines are showing us what's coming in. And so we're fle fleeting equipment to those ports to make sure we've got enough there for the boats that are arriving with the IPI volume that wants to move. Sort of a ballet though. It's, uh, you, you really have to uh, keep track on a real time basis, uh, both uh, with both of you, uh, just what, what the, the traffic flows are. Um, Jay? Yeah, so uh, at CSX, we've got a reservation system and the reservation system is, is you know, with, with billing already processed and, 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 and valid in our system, you can attach a reservation to a specific train for a specific day. And we have a window, normally 24 hours, you know, we, we, we expand that when, when we need to approaching weekends on occasion when you're not dealing with, with heavy congestion. Uh, to, to allow more boxes in and utilize those lesser used trains that, that tend to be on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, on the port side, you know, the, almost all of our business is loaded on dock. And so the loading is, is, is done at the Marine terminal level. And then we receive a train and, and, you know, we operate the same schedule seven days a week. So we're going to and coming from the ports on a, the same cadence every day. So, um, uh, you, you all have been fantastic uh, uh, participants. I really appreciate uh, the information. Uh, we'll undoubtedly probably uh, turn to you again. We're uh, hoping to do a data summit, and and uh, the intermodal rail data element is is uh, is is critical. And then you need experts that that can uh, tell us what's what's happening there. Um, uh, and as a matter of fact, we, uh, uh, my counsel John Young and. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kristen Monaco, uh, who's our um, 
director of uh, of Bureau of uh, Transportation Analysis are all going to uh, go out to Chicago and and get a firsthand exposure to the intermodal rail system. We're working with the uh, AER on on doing that because we want to uh, make sure we're we're uh, we understand it. Uh, we we knew know a little bit more than ports and than rail terminals, but they're they're very similar in terms of operational uh, issues uh, in this area. Uh, but I wanted to ask you all if uh, uh, this is a, a total uh, discretionary uh, a question. Uh, if you had uh, some uh, in dealing with uh, certain companies that have good operating uh, uh, programs that are uh, efficient, uh, if you wanted to, uh, uh, to make any recommendations that we take a look at any sort of uh, technology out there, either yours or, or someone else's, we, we, we were, were uh, looking around to see what's out there and, and what's available. So I don't want to do it uh, here because uh, I want it to be uh, confidential uh, uh, for various reasons, but, uh, but we're open to suggestions uh, from you. And uh, I hope you will uh, continue to, to, uh, to follow uh, this initiative. Uh, and uh, uh, I think you're a really good panel that, that gave us uh, uh, great answers and, and uh, uh, a better, a better understanding of intermodal rail. Again, I think it's long term if we don't do this the right way, we're one missing an advantage for your companies to do better uh, in transport in general, and and also missing a huge advantage in uh, efficiency and uh, and and expedited movement of goods that uh, that will uh, that will cost us all at the end of, of the day. Um, uh, Kristen, did you want to ask any questions? Uh, um, Anything else that you wanted to, to supplement? Um, I think I did have a question I just wanted to follow up on. I can't remember which of the speakers talked about information exchange, obviously, between the railroads themselves, which is so very important in moving freight all the way across the country. Can you elaborate a little bit more about how you collaborate and any gaps that you've sort of bridged and, and how you went about that? Uh, Jim, you want to start off? I think if I was mistaken, it was relative to uh, some of the comments that Jay had made relative to the standardization of, of EDI and really those standards being in place for a number of decades. You know, Kristen, that really has been an evolution. Uh, this was long before any APIs, but it was really a common format and a standard format so we can help facilitate interchange traffic to and from us seamlessly. So it's been an evolution uh, over time. I don't know about my other counterparts, my odd as well. Who manages that, Jim? Is it manages railroad to railroad or is, it, uh, is there an intermediary? There is, I uh, can't recall exactly the name of that group that does that. Um, let's see, Scott. Yeah, so we actually have a, a data that we share with uh, Union Pacific down in Southern California called the Business Exchange. It's a web-based platform because, you know, both BNSF and Union Pacific at times go into the same marine terminals. And so to kind of facilitate the movement, we have a web-based system that we both go in at the port operation side and input information on when trains are going to be spotted, when trains are going to be released. And that, that's one way that we try to communicate in between each other to try to facilitate overall, you know, Southern California operations versus siloing. That, that's something we've had in place for over a decade now that's been um, pretty helpful in, in that communication path. And so marine terminal operators and BNSF, Union Pacific all look at the exact same information that kind of tell the big picture story. Okay. Hey, DeAndre, with, let's say Norfolk Southern's taking something from New York or Norfolk to Chicago, what, what, what sort of information do they, but it's going to go to the West Coast, ultimately land bridge, uh, what sort of how do, how do they uh, transfer that information about the shipment and, uh, and the same sort of is that directly calling basically or is it is there some sort of uh, electronic data data transfer so the shipper will typically build that through where it's automatic it comes to chicago and where it still wills we we that's an automatic process uh, more routinized, we have an interline services department that works with all the other railroads to make okay. sure that um, you know schedule and, and connections are are managed and kept up with business conditions and things of that sort. Uh, Jay, 
Yeah, it just uh, there was it was my comment. Uh, and it was an EDI transmission between us and the railroads, and that's you know all of us sit on uh, a committee at the AAR. Most I'm sure it's not us; it's our technology people who really you know how that stuff works. Um, but that that was where my comment was is that relative to the the standardization that the railroads have you know evolved to over the years and where that's derived from. Okay. Okay. Well. I'm going to uh, gavel uh, closed uh, today, but really a great uh, par uh, participation by all of the four railroads. I, I really appreciate it. Um, we'll, we'll undoubtedly be uh, back in contact, but uh, uh, a fantastic job uh, for, from all four of you. Um, it, uh, it gives us, I think, a good exposure to, to some of the challenges and, and some of the areas that we could uh, look at in the future. Um, Again, we will be doing a, a data summit in the, in the spring. And so I'd love to have uh, uh, you or, or, or someone from your company uh, participate in that as we go through that. Um, but uh, uh, thank you again. And uh, I really appreciate your time and thoughtfulness. Okay, Carl, I think we can close it. <laughs>